everyone. My name is Nina Prasad, and I am the VP of Customer Operations at InfoSec Global. Today, we have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Tahir Algamal, who is a pioneer in information security and the world of cryptography. Tahir has served as the founder, CEO, CISO, CTO, and chief scientist advisor and investor at many successful organizations. He is the recipient of the 2009 RSA Conference Lifetime Achievement Award and is the 2019 Marconi Prize recipient. He has been described as the father of SSL, which is the secure socket layer, for the work he's done in computer security, which has helped establish private and secure communications on the internet. Tahir has invented several industry and government standards in data security, and digital signatures, including the DSS government standard for digital signatures. He also holds a PhD from Stanford in electrical engineering and computer science. Tahir is currently a partner at Evolution Equity Partners, where he invests in security companies really looking to make an impact in the market. So in today's session, we will dive into critical topics surrounding the transition of to post-quantum cryptography, the significance of crypto agility, and how these concepts really impact highly regulated industries and governments. Additionally, we will uncover the origin story of InfoSec Global and Tahera's motivation for co-founding InfoSec Global with Nagi Mustafa. So thank you so much for joining us today, Taher. Thank you, Nina. It's a pleasure to be here. So to start, let's provide some insights into the challenges and implications of transitioning to post-quantum cryptography. So, Tahir, can you tell us what the current state of post-quantum cryptography is and why it's crucial for organizations to consider its adoption? Oh, uh, you're asking the end of the question. So to start, the current state of cryptography is rather interesting because for a long, long time, for the last decades, we actually told people that they should not invest in cryptography. Cryptography comes from their vendors and they should use it. They should not change any of it, which is still true. They should not actually change any of it. Um, but they never actually built any understanding of what cryptography is running to begin with. Then the world comes in and says, hey, if, if, if a big enough quantum computer shows up, you know, all of these things get broken. Uh, people do not understand what that statement means. Uh, the, the public key cryptography methods that are used today, RSA and ECC, for example, would actually perhaps get broken if a big enough quantum computer were to exist. Uh, and if that happens, then somebody needs to change things. Uh, NIST has sponsored uh, a project for the last many years to actually come up with a new set of standards in public key cryptography to actually substitute, to change what we have today into a, a more resilient set of, uh, of cryptographic algorithms that will, will work even if a quantum computer exists. Uh, changing cryptography is not a something that people actually have ever done or understood. So you can wait for some vendors to show up with things uh, the, the truth is people have built a lot of different applications and devices and uh, environments. They actually use cryptography by picking up libraries from sometimes open source, sometimes they bought it from vendors. And they just the developers will just use the, the library as is and there is embedded cryptography and nobody knows what it is. So, so changing something you do not know to something else is, is just a difficult task. You know, when 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 you ask the, the CISOs of the large banks, they kind of estimate it might take them about a decade to actually migrate from the existing cryptographic infrastructure to something that is quantum safe. Uh, and a decade from when they start, most of them are kind of starting, uh, you know, to sort of understand where they are. Um, the NIST algorithms do exist. There will be libraries, there is vendors, there is open source. So the actual end, end condition actually does exist. But changing uh, from an environment that just got built over a lot of years to something new and more resilient is, is, is a real big project that people are, are starting to sort of get their arms around. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Tahir. I mean, with security being absolutely paramount in many industries, how do you see this transition to post-quantum cryptography really affecting highly regula regulated industries like financial services or government agencies, for that matter? I mean, there's new standards. Uh, 
So the government, it's a their NIST standard. NIST is part of the U.S. government, but they usually create international standards. So for, for the case of AES, for example, it's been a standard for several years, and it came out of NIST, the same organization, and everybody in the world uses AES. It's, it's a global standard. Um, uh, you know, trying to understand the details of things is very tricky because cryptography is a specialty. And most organizations just do not have the knowledge to understand how do I change RSA to something else, Kyber or something else that, that NIST has proposed. Although the implementations of the new standards do exist. So, so that transition project is, is really a project rather than a technology thing. If, if you go and give somebody an implementation of the new algorithms and leave, they're not going to be able to do anything with it because they just do not know where the cryptography is to begin with. They do not know which things need to change. What they do know or should know is what's important to them. And at the top of the important thing is what you raise, which is regulation. Because if, if you're not abiding by regulation, kind of you cannot do business anymore. So it's not about security anymore. It's actually about the ability to do business. And we know that U.S. government has set deadlines for U.S. agencies, for example, to that they have to go to, to the post-quantum algorithms by day X or whatever. Um, similar things will appear in the commercial world. Because, because you know, when when we when we encounter the fact that quantum computers are in fact being funded, very heavily funded, as a matter of fact, and they're growing in complexity and, and so on. Um, you know, nobody really knows when that quantum big quantum computer that that can break the, the current RSA or ECC exists. Nobody's going to be able to predict exactly. But if it takes 10 years to get there, then preparing becomes becomes an immediate need. I mean, could you share some examples of just real, real world scenarios where the quantum threat is particularly concerning? So, so there is multiple things here. Um, the, one of the interesting ones is the current Internet traffic is, in fact, all encrypted, let's assume. With, with the current versions of TLS and the current algorithms and so on. If you were to take that and store it someplace and just keep it encrypted, don't do a thing with it, wait until the big quantum computer shows up and try to decrypt, you will actually be successful. So people call this store now decrypt later or whatever. Uh, and we actually know for a fact that there are certain governments that are doing this, just storing the encrypted traffic. Maybe at some point in the future, they will learn something different. The data, even if it takes 10 or 15 years, the data that you, you, you store and be able to decrypt later will be worth something. You know, my credit card number is not worth anything in 10 or 15 years, but there is a lot of healthcare data, there is communications, there's intellectual property, there's a lot of conversations that are very, very tricky and actually sensitive, even 10 years from now. Um, so, so that is kind of what people talk about. Uh, why why this is needed sooner than later. Um, and, you know, if anybody cares about who's recording their conversations, they should actually care about this. Good point. Absolutely. Well, let's explore the concept of crypto agility and its role in ensuring security in just this rapidly evol evolving digital landscape. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, what exactly does crypto agility mean? And how can it help organizations really adapt to emerging threats like quantum computing? I'm assuming you're asking what I believe crypto agility means, not what everybody else, because every, everybody has an opinion about the subject. So why is crypto agility a thing to begin with? So crypto agility is a thing because if we suppose we convince you know, all the entities that they take the current cryptography migrated to some next generation things that are quantum resistant. There is nothing that guarantees that these new algorithms will never get broken. Because cryptography is a matter of computation. It is not a matter of mathematical proofs. 
So the, 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 the bigger the computers are, the more things get broken. And then, you know, some number of years later, you need to do the same exercise again. So if, if somebody took 10 years to take the current state of affairs and migrate into a new set of, of cryptography algorithms, you don't want them to take another 10 years to do the next one because there will not be another 10 years. When you know something is broken, generally, you want to migrate as quick as you can. So today, cryptography is embedded into things. There are certain places that are easier to substitute algorithms, like you know some TLS versions would allow you to do that. And there are certain cases where the cryptography is deep inside of some piece of software or hardware that you don't even know where it starts and where it ends. Sometimes you don't even know which library was used to actually build an application, for example. People have done you know, encryption of data at rest because it is actually a regulation in a number of different industries. So when you encrypt data at rest with an algorithm that that is maybe going to be broken by something, that is actually a dangerous thing because all of a sudden the data at rest, you can get the key and, and then you can decrypt it. So changing these things is in fact difficult. So the way the world is thinking is, let's migrate into a, into a situation where it's easier to change cryptographic algorithms. That whenever you need to modify an algorithm or modify an, an, a key size or modify keys or, or anything like that, that there is actually a, a, a management console that you can, you can do that from, just like you have management consoles for everything else. IT organizations have management consoles for endpoints. So you can migrate, you can put in endpoint, you know, products to manage security on the endpoint, for example. That's an accepted thing. Uh, th there is nothing in, in the cryptography world. So, so to me, cryptographic agility means let's let's work on getting things right first. And while you're doing that, you can migrate some of the algorithms. But on an ongoing basis, it just becomes a matter of doing business. As in, if you need to change key sizes, or you need to change algorithms wholesale, or you need to change whatever you need to change. In the cryptography infrastructure of any organization, it's just, it's just a simple matter of configuring things rather than substituting libraries and you know compiling code and doing these things that will actually not work at all. Thanks, Tahir, for that. I mean, do you have some practical examples or some advice for organizations really looking to build a crypto agile like security framework? Um, the truth is there's very few people that understand what that statement actually means. So my advice is talk to your, to your, talk to your trusted advisors or vendors or partners or whoever. Because there is no existing business today for people to implement cryptography agility. It just doesn't exist. There are there are ideas and you know new companies, ISG is, is one of them, obviously, uh, that actually are promoting specific ways of, you know, here is a way to do cryptography agility. But if you ask an operating person in any organization, small, medium, or large, or even extra large, they actually, nobody's thinking about cryptography agility as of yet, because it was not a subject. They were not supposed to even manage the crypto. We told them, don't manage your cryptography. We're going to do it for you. Just trust us. And then all of a sudden, you wake up one day and say, oh, my God, uh, uh, I do need to change that stuff now. So agility just becomes, you know, one of the most important tools to build things correctly. That's what it really is. Well, that's a great segue into my next question, because I would love, or we would all love to learn about the motivation behind creating InfoSec Global. I mean, what inspired you and our co-founder, Nagy Mustafa, to really launch the company? Um, you know, Nagy and I have different opinions. So here you are. You're going to hear my opinion since I'm the one here. Um, uh, you can delete that if you wish, but it's okay. <laughs> um, you know, uh, several years back, we were talking to different people around the world about their use of cryptography, and people said, hey, you know, we have specific applications that we want to use different cryptography for. 
and we look at just say, what is that? There is no different cryptography. There's standards. You use the standards and the story. They said, no, but we want to trust our own cryptography. And these conversations happen around the world. There is no one or two or three. There's a lot of different places in the world that say, you know, we want to use different cryptography that we built internally and we trust more and we want to use it for sensitive things. And it's our right to do that. The current systems just do not make that possible. Uh, there is no place in the current systems to have multiple cryptography algorithms running. It's, it's you use this and this is the end of the story. Um, so, you know, Nagy and I called it multi-crypto initially, which is, hey, can you allow someone to run multiple different algorithms sort of at the same time? So if I'm talking to, you know, some e-commerce site, I use the standard. If I'm talking to somebody in the government, then I use the government standard. So you can run multiple things. And that never existed. That actually gradually went into agility. Um, because the, the idea of agility came from, you know, people are going to have to run multiple things. And they don't have to run them at the same time, but they are multiple things. If I have to change from RSA to some, you know, Kyber-based things in the future to, 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 to be resilient to, to like quantum attacks, I have to change things, and I do not know how to change things. So, so the idea actually continued to grow with time, which was kind of cool. Um, but that's that's how that's really how it started. And you know, background in cryptography helps, and it kind of we continue to talk to these people. Some of them built their own, and some of them asked for somebody else to help them build the soft stuff, and and that conversation still is still happening. Um, in addition to the quantum threat. Yeah, it's really interesting. I remember being in previous roles where there was this very obvious gap in the market, but no one was really filling it. And then when I met with uh, you and Nagy and the team, I was like, ah, okay, this is the company that's now going to fill in this very apparent gap in the security market. Um, so I'm curious about how how is ISG, how is InfoSec Global contributing to advancing the field of information security, particularly in the context of post-quantum cryptography? Uh, you know, uh, look, ISG participated in everything. ISG submitted proposals to NIST to choose between, you know, as, as a number of standards were, were being picked. Um they participate in the experiments that NIST is running to sort of see how these things are going to run and so on. There's a name for that that I forgot. Um, but the vision is the most important thing. I mean, there's, current, there's a lot of current things. There's existing customers that use different flavors of things that ISG has been building. Um, the most important thing is the vision because, um, and, and, and Nagy, will agree with this one, that there is a crypto agility patent that, that ISG filed many years back because, because we actually believe that this will be a real market. And now all of a sudden, it is a real market. There's a number of vendors in this space, but there's, there's actually crypto agility patents that are owned by ISG, which is very important. I don't believe that people should be substituting one at a time, and then when you need to substitute, again, you go through the same process one more time. Deplacing libraries is not a simple thing in software if it's kind of hardwired into something. Um, so, so, you know, there is fundamental technology that is, is being built to sort of migrate the world into modern cryptography use. And modern cryptography use basically demands that the use of some agility someplace. Wonderful. Well, Tahir, I want to take advantage and take the opportunity to really reflect on your contributions to the world of cybersecurity and your vision for the future. Um, you're often referred to as the father of SSL. I don't know if you like that name or not, <laughs> but... Um, Wikipedia decided oh, Wikipedia? to call me that. I do not know who that, who it's a Wikipedia name. That's correct. That's how. Well, that's can you share from. just some key insights into the development of SSL um, and its impact on secure communications? I mean, the development of SSL happened in the Netscape day. So you go back 30 years, just about. 
And Netscape started saying, hey, there's an internet all over the place. We need to be able to use this internet to do commercial business. And the first idea was, in fact, e-commerce, as in enable people to buy and sell on the big internet that is worldwide. And, and the first thing that came up was, wow, the internet is so open. So if I want to buy something, everybody's going to see what I'm buying and how much and that kind of thing. Uh, and it's actually worse because they can also, you know, modify the content, which is kind of interesting. So, so the, the SSL requirements were, number one, you need to make sure you're talking to the right party. Because if you're talking to the wrong party and send them $1,000, $1,000 is gone. Uh, the second thing is you have to make sure people cannot modify things. I mean, it may be annoying for somebody to know that you have $1,000 in a bank account uh, or that you're sending $1,000 from A to B. It would be more annoying if they can actually add a zero or, or remove a zero or do something different. So, so the integrity of the transactions become really important. And all of that in, in addition to what people talk about the most, which is confidentiality. So privacy or confidentiality, although they come up more in, in, in the public discussions of things, are actually the least important things from, from a technical standpoint. Um, you know, I see your face here on, on, on this video thing. I believe it's actually you. It could, nowadays, it could be a, a, an AI generated. Who knows? But, but there is actually a proof that I'm talking to Nina. Um, and I hear your voice, and your voice sounds like your voice before. So, so there is actually proof of things. Uh, if you do not know that you're talking to the correct party, then it's actually the worst thing that can happen. If the integrity is messed up, so so this is this is how a SSL conversation came up because you need to satisfy these three things. Yeah, and you know, Netscape took it upon itself to actually build it because there was no such thing around, and the success of the company was actually dependent on this. And we did write patents, but the patents were not made to actually charge people for it. The, 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 the vision was always to give it away to the world and to make it a standard. Because if it's not a standard, then everybody comes up with their own kind of way to encrypt data over e-commerce. The world would have been a real complicated thing at this point in time. The, the way you know it became an IETF standard and it's free and it's built everywhere, uh, it just it just made this industry succeed. Um, it is shocking to see where SSL is running today. I mean, I was there in, the, in day zero, but it runs everywhere, literally. I, I do not know why my fridge is running SSL, but it actually does. It, it, the, I mean, you could argue there's no reason, but it actually is because because all the Linux code has it built in, so so it's built into every single thing. So the growth of this is, is kind of mind-boggling, but it, it became an important part of the industry. Absolutely, absolutely. What sort of advice do you have for aspiring security professionals who want to follow in your footsteps? <laughs> the advice is do not follow in my footsteps. <laughs> the cybersecurity market today, you know, I'm an investor in cybersecurity, so I see the industry at large now, and I talk to founders of companies from all different sides in the world. There's a lot of different areas in cybersecurity. Uh, you know, we built the backbone basically with cryptography and SSL. Uh, but the number of breaches and attacks and, you know, is growing every single day, as everybody knows. And th there are opportunities for people to, you know, contribute in a lot of different areas. So, so you know, when I started, there was no such thing. Um, but nowadays, you know, you can specialize in any aspect of information security and build a very successful career. Um, you don't have to rebuild the back. I mean, we, we have to rebuild the backbone because of the quantum computing thing. So, so, so we actually do have to rebuild it because the cryptography needs to change. But as far as careers in cybersecurity, uh, there is so much, um, that is available to people. Yeah, I mean, there's thousands of people, and people say, hey, there's millions of open jobs in cybersecurity worldwide, and, and nobody can fill them. So clearly, you know, the, the, there is room for people to build careers there.
lots of opportunity for sure. Well, we received some great advice and insight on post-quantum cryptography and crypto agility from you, Tahir, in this session, which has been wonderful. What are the key takeaways you want our audience to really remember from today's conversation? Uh, uh, you know, we always complain that there's too much hacking and too much, to, a lot of breaches and, you know, ransomware this and this and that and the other thing. All of this happened in spite of the fact that the backbone is actually strong. We're, we're building security models that assume that cryptography works. If the cryptography does not work anymore and somebody can actually break the, the connection between A and B, uh, the world will change dramatically to the worse, obviously, from my standpoint. Um, so, so my, my my advice is do not let that go away because it is, in fact, one of the most important things to do in, in setting up an information security program. Now, you know, 30 years ago, there weren't that many people building things. So it was easier to contain what is being built. Now, there is so many libraries and vendors and you know, people building, doing things together. Protocols need people to understand each other. It's like a language. So supporting a different version of TLS requires that you be part of the industry. Uh, you know, you and I are using a browser right now. If, if the browser vendor does not support the new cryptography, I do not know what to do. So, so, so there is a piece of this that we all need to contribute to improving this new world. And there is a piece of this that every company needs to take care of its own data and its own security. So, so the combo is actually required. And Tahir, any last thoughts or messages you'd like to share about the future of cryptography or cybersecurity in general or InfoSec Global's mission? Well, the, the message is it is not really required that people understand the technical detail of why cryptography works. Um, you can outsource that. You can outsource a lot of things, by the way, yeah, because small companies, have all, I mean, even big companies outsource things. The, ones, the, the one or two things that you cannot outsource is the risk. The risk is part of the business. So if you outsource the risk to somebody else to tell you this is the risky part, then you're lost. Then the game is over. Um, so, so people need to think about the risk. Where are the important assets? The as, I mean, the important assets, it's up to business decide. Maybe you're actually putting them someplace. But that someplace is up to you to decide. You can move that from some to a different place. You can change whoever you're outsourcing to. But, but understanding where the assets are and what can harm the business, which is business risk, is in fact the thing that we need to all think about, which we haven't. You know, you hear kind of rumors about, hey, the board of directors of companies now are, you know, getting more and more into cyber risk and that kind of thing. And they, they are getting into it because everybody's getting breached, basically. Um, I, I think there needs to be a focus on how do we build a better collective digital world, basically. Uh, not just, you know, make sure that we're not getting ransomware. Of course, not getting ransomware is a good thing. But there's there's a ton of other things. There is building of an infrastructure, which is, you know, uh, uh, InfoSec Global is actually part of that 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 people need to pay attention to. Well, thank you so much, Tahir, for your time and your insights today. I thought today's conversation covered a lot of ground that our listeners will find very valuable, and we're really grateful to have a leader and visionary like you at the helm. Um, to our audience, thank you for tuning in. We would encourage you to follow InfoSec Global online to keep on top of cybersecurity trends, content like this video, and partnerships by visiting www.infosecglobal.com. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us today, and bye for now.